Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Retaliation. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you. From him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Okay, I don't want to teach this today. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> Retaliation. What Jesus is teaching about here in these verses before us is retribution. We also refer to retribution as payback or getting even. And what Jesus is teaching us, and you might want to note this, this is the heart of what he'll be teaching us. We'll see this as we go through these verses. Is He's teaching us against having what would be called a vindictive attitude. A person who has a vindictive attitude is a person who is disposed to seeking revenge. They are people who are spiteful, who can be intentionally hurtful. And so Jesus is teaching against having this vindictive spirit, this intentional, hurtful spirit, this spiteful, vengeful spirit. You see, our natural inclination is to get even with those who hurt us. It's been said revenge is a dish best served cold. And there are a lot of people who understand exactly what that means. I, I, I read of a woman who wrote down every mean thing said or done to her in a notebook. She wanted it documented so that she could get back at the people who were so unkind to her. You know, there are actual sites on the Internet that offer suggestions of how to get revenge on someone. I won't give you the site. You'll find it yourself. One page I was looking at actually gave ways to get even with people who have hurt you. These are suggestions. These are actual suggestions on a particular page where the person is saying, these are the things you can do to get even with somebody who has hurt you. And these are the suggestions. They begin by saying, sink to their level and play dirty. Send anonymous letters. Make anonymous phone calls. Send mean text messages. Gossip about them on Facebook. Post personal information about them in public places, like writing their phone number on phone booths. Hide frozen shrimp in their desk, locker, or under their chair and let it rot. Order offensive material and have it sent to them. Make them look stupid on the job. Monitor every slip and failure and then mention it openly. Bombard them with irritating tweets and stupid Instagram photos. I mean, there's a whole page. I only gave you a few of them. Some of you are writing furiously. You can get the, the tape later. There are people who have exceptionally novel ways of exacting revenge. I read of a man who discovered his wife of 24 years was cheating on him. And you know what he did? He listed her as for sale on eBay <laughs> as a lying adulteress. You know, for sale, one lying adulteress. He actually listed her on eBay. Some people seem to thrive on the desire to get even with those who have even simply irritated them. They desire to actually hurt others. Some actually, and we know this, actually seem to live to hurt others. In Proverbs 4.16, evil people cannot sleep until they have done their evil deed for the day. They cannot rest unless they have caused someone to stumble. And there are people indeed just like that. Personal hurts can cause us to stay awake at night wishing that we could somehow find a way to get even. Somebody said, I know there are people who believe you should forgive and forget. For the record, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of forgiveness as long as I'm given the opportunity to get even first. And there are people exactly like that. And, and it's easy for us to get in a position where we are angry and desiring vengeance on somebody, even for the slightest things. You might have been married, or 
were in a relationship, and it ended badly. At one time, you used to speak about how wonderful this person was. You would say things like, they're just right for me. But now that this relationship has ended, you go out and you begin to share all their faults with people. It may be that when you were in high school or previous to high school, you had been bullied uh, by people. And uh, you got bullied by the popular kids, but now you go to a reunion, a 10-year reunion, a 20-year reunion, and you see these people who used to bully you, the, the, the ones who were so cool, and, and time hasn't been kind to them. And you start feeling pretty good about how ugly they are now. <laughs> At one time, you loved the church that you attended. You loved it a lot, and you invited your friends, but you got hurt somehow, and you're no longer there. And so what do you do? Well, you begin to not only badmouth the church and the pastor and everybody there, but you begin to invite your friends to leave also. Those are natural inclinations. And Jesus is teaching us how to deal with these impulses. They are understandable, of course, but they don't represent the best that we can be. In Proverbs 24, 17, the writer said, Do not rejoice when your enemies fall into trouble. Don't be happy when they stumble. In reality... We have to come to grips with the things that have hurt us and we have to leave them in the hands of the Lord because if we don't, the desire for revenge will consume us. In Proverbs 20, verse 22, do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord and he will save you. You know, often we protect what we consider to be our rights and we end up angry with everybody we don't want to be somebody's doormat, and so we react quickly to any perceived slights. We're standing in line at the supermarket, and somebody cuts in front of us, and we get angry. We begin to count the amounts of goods they're placing on that, you know, in front of us. It says 10 items or less, and you're counting them. The guy's got 11. You got to boot them out of line. And you say, you know what? You've got more items. And the guy says, no, look, it. I've got some bologna. I've got some bread. I've got some ham. I've got some, some uh, lettuce. I've got tomatoes. And that all makes one sandwich. <laughs> so we get mad. I mean, we, we, I don't know where that came from. I, I'm, I'm jet lagged, I'm telling you. You know, you have to wait for something at, at, at a place, wherever it may be. And before you know it, you begin to get angry that you're waiting so long, and then you begin to threaten, and you say, I'll never come back to this place again, doing them a favor, actually. If somebody gets what we worked for so hard, a promotion, a raise, we become angry, and we devise ways to get even with them for taking what we perceive to be our own. You see, the desire for vengeance is something that, that isn't to be cultivated, and that's what Jesus is speaking of as we look at this passage. Now, notice... He, he begins with the phrase in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. Now that quotation is an Old Testament quotation, obviously. It's found in Exodus chapter 21, for example. Verses 21 through 25, the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus. And it says there, if men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Leviticus 24, 19 and 20, if anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. So there is Old Testament law that pertains to this. So what is Jesus saying when he says, an eye for an eye? You know, Gandhi misunderstood this saying. He said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. He misunderstood what the Old Testament was teaching, even as the people during Jesus' day misunderstood what that passage intended to communicate. Because Jesus was teaching 
that the penalty must exactly match the crime. It speaks of proper, legitimate, balanced, and equitable justice. That's what Jesus is speaking about. And so the commandment that was given actually had a purpose. Uh, one, as you look at the commandment, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it was to serve to put a stop to a person committing further crimes. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth was to prevent further crimes. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 19, it says, you must purge the evil from among you. So this would have stopped them from committing further crimes. Secondly, it was to serve as a deterrent to, to future crime. People actually would witness the punishment that was enacted upon those who committed the crime. Now, the punishment was not to be a source of entertainment in a time in the history of the United States, they would have a, an execution, a hanging, we'll say, and, and people actually treated it like it was a picnic, and that wasn't what it was intended to do. It wasn't to be a source of entertainment at all. It was to be a warning. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 20, the rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid, and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. So it was to keep someone from committing further crimes. It was a deterrent to the people who witnessed the punishment. And third, it prevented punishment based solely on personal vengeance. You see, the law of an eye for an eye would be fair, and it would prevent overkill. Vengeance and extreme punishment was avoided because human vengeance can be very unjust. If somebody hurts you, you may go full throttle on them and, and harm them in a way that they didn't harm you. And so this is supposed to be speaking of equitable, of proper justice, a proper measurement for justice, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, when Jesus was ministering under the present rabbinic tradition, the element of justice often was neglected. So instead of punishment fitting the crime, eliminating vengeance, it actually became a way for getting even. So here, Jesus is correcting this teaching. That's why he says, but I tell you, not to resist an evil person. So he's referring to the attitude of personal spite, resentful retribution. He's speaking against that attitude. He's saying to me as a believer, don't go out of your way to try and harm somebody because they harmed you. Don't go out of your way to try to get even with somebody because you have perceived a slight. Don't be trying to always get even. Don't have a vindictive, vengeful spirit. You need to step out of the way. And, and this is something that the law as misinterpreted at this point during the time of Christ, this is something that people would use a lot to say, well, we, could, we, can get, we can get even in this fashion. And Jesus is saying, no, I want to teach you something about the spirit of the law. That's why he says, I'll tell you not to, I tell you not to resist an evil person. Proverbs 24, 29, do not say, I will do to him just as he's done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Don't say that. So he's not saying that we should never take a stand against that which is wrong. I, I need to hasten to say that right now because there are those who would say, well, then Christians, really, you ought to just be quiet and leave things alone. You shouldn't really ever say anything about how you view culture or you view society or what's going on in the world. There are many who, who feel that it's a good thing for the church to just kind of do what we're doing right now, cloister in a room Keep your opinions to yourself. Don't take them outside of this room here. You know, the public square really isn't for you. It's for those who agree with me. And so you Christians really, you ought to just keep these things to yourself. Jesus isn't teaching us that. He's not saying that we should just allow evil to, to thrive. Uh, in verse 39, some could read that. I tell you not to resist uh, an evil person. And so they can say, see, you're not to resist. Is that what he's saying? No, we're not to excuse, we're not to hide, we're not to cover up wrongdoing. If we do that, then sin itself goes unchecked. Remember, Jesus in chapter 5 here in verses 13 through 16 had spoken of us as the church as being salt and light. No, we have a purpose here on the face of the earth, and we're not to, uh, we're not to resist you know, doing that which God has called us to do. We've been created to do certain things. When, when we encounter something, guys, that is, that is wrong, that is really not good for society, and remember that God's word is intended to
to promote the health and well-being of society along with so many other things. But it's intended to, to provide places of blessing that God can bring to people who follow him. Uh, when we have an opportunity as Christians, uh, we should try to learn to clearly present uh, biblical perspectives on current things. We have not only the right to do that, thank God for the nation that we live in, that we have a right to do that, but we also have a responsibility to do that. And I know that I have a lot of friends who, who have a real desire to be able to present biblical perspective relating to certain things who perhaps uh, in the youthfulness of their, their faith have, have yet to really develop um, a strong biblical argument or perspective, and that's why we study. That's why we go to Bible studies. That why, that's why we read the Word of God, and that's why we ask God to give us clear insights and all of that. So as a Christian, I, I become equipped to be able to give a defense concerning the things that I firmly hold fast to. I remember one uh, member of the church I used to assist. I was an assistant pastor before I planted this church. And one of the young men at that time approached me and said to me, Pastor, what do we believe about this? And that's the way he said it. What do we believe about this? And I said, I know what I believe about this, but what is it that you believe? Because it's not my responsibility to believe for you. But if you're asking me a question related to what the scripture says, so you can study and learn these things on your own, I'll share these things with you. But see, it's not my responsibility to believe anything on your behalf. It's your responsibility to believe certain things that God gives to us. You know, that's our responsibility, personally. I can't believe for somebody else. I can only believe for the things that God has given to me. And so my role as a uh, pastor is to encourage you to develop a hunger, you know, continue to develop a hunger for the Word of God, and to study so that you might have biblical perspective on various cultural issues and all. And on occasion, I will refer to the obvious things that go on in our culture and, and present to you what, what Scripture says related to those things because you may have opportunity on the job site or in the neighborhood or at the school or wherever it is that you are, you might have an occasion to be able to share a little bit of a different perspective that many people have yet to really hear. You see, the Christian perspective very often is so muddled or it is, so, it is presented in such a, a biased way that it's just simply unfair. I mean, it, it comes in so many ways. I heard a comedian say, you know, that at one time he said uh, the fish were in the water and then they, they developed lungs and they came out of the water. And he, it's a comedic act. And he says, oh, sorry, homeschoolers. You know, and it was part of his line and everybody laughs because naturally he's saying that homeschoolers must be ignorant to not realize that a fish actually developed lungs and walked on the face of the earth. We never really go beyond. Why would a fish develop lungs? It'd be like me right now developing gills. Well, why would I do that? But we never really think about that and it's never really answered. And so there are a lot of issues that, that we as Christians uh, are, that ought to be equipped to be able to deal with. And so I, I wondered and I prayed about it, I thought about, should I bring this up? I've, I've brought it up before. But I'll bring it up again in the, in the event that some of you might want a perspective to, to research for yourself. And, uh, and obviously, one of the examples when it, it comes to uh, learning to clearly present biblical perspectives on current issues, an obvious example uh, that is being waged at this moment is a battle that is over the mainstreaming of homosexuality. Now, now I'm going to ask a question. I normally don't do this because many don't know this, uh, but how many of you, and, and, and don't embarrass yourself. If you don't want to, don't respond. It's okay, but I asked the first service, and, and they responded, so if you don't, you're worse than them. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I asked the first service today. I said, how many of you know, how many of you know that in the 50s, how many of you know that homosexuality was presented in the 50s in this nation as a mental illness. How many of you know that? Raise your hand. Okay, if you looked around, out of the group here, maybe 40 of you raised your hand just now. The overwhelming majority of this church doesn't know that. Does not know that in the 50s, homosexuality 
was regarded as a mental illness. The American Psychiatric Association listed homosexuality as a mental disorder. In 1953, President Eisenhower said it was sufficient reasons to fire a federal employee. So today, homosexuals have made an effort to not simply be tolerated, but to be accepted. Every means possible is being used, including music, television, movies, and our public schools. There are shows like Alan, Glee, Grey's Anatomy, The New Normal, Modern Family that have mainstreamed homosexuality. The Hollywood Reporter stated that 27% of viewers surveyed said that homosexual TV programs have made them more in favor of homosexual marriage. There was a report in 1948, it's called the Kinsey Report, and in the report the conclusion was one out of 10 Americans, or human beings really, are homosexual. And that became the mantra of the land, when in fact its findings were both inaccurate and biased. You see, Dr. Kinsey was bisexual. He was referred to as a sexual revolutionary. And I was reading concerning this, and I was reading this quote, his Kinsey reports are junk science. Professor of Constitutional Law, Dr. Charles Rice of Notre Dame, concluded that Alfred Kinsey's research was contrived, ideologically driven, and misleading. Any judge, legislator, or other public official who gives credence to that research is guilty of malpractice and dereliction of duty. Now, in the risk of being a hater, that's one of the words that is used concerning me, and... Uh, because I hate everybody, um, but in taking the risk of being called a hater, um, this particular attitude has inundated, as we know, and become accepted in a very short time. Now, in Oakland, school children have been indoctrinated with a belief that you can choose your gender. In grades kindergarten and first grade, uh, they can be taught that there are lots of ways to be boys, girls, or both. Recommended reading for five and six-year-olds is My Princess Boy. In grades two and three, they learn gender diversity in nature and gender biology, expression, and identity. Recommended reading for a seven and eight-year-old, 10,000 dresses. Grades four, fourth and fifth are being taught concepts like kids can be boys, girls, both, or neither and they've been taught the subject three dimensions of gender. This is called indoctrination. The National Center for Health Statistics and Centers for Disease Control findings are instructive. The Kinsey Report stated that one in 10 hom are homosexual. New findings debunk this. The newest and latest government study finds that that figure is actually 1.4%. It, it, it's revealing that when a well-known person comes out of the closet, they're applauded. They're regarded as courageous for revealing their true nature. Neil Patrick Harris, Adam Lambert, Leslie Gore, Clay Aiken, Matt Dallas, Anderson Cooper, all were applauded when they came, quote unquote, out of the closet. Yet when a homosexual claims to have been transformed by the power of the Spirit of God through coming to faith in Christ, they are ridiculed. We recognize that this is sinful choice but it has devastating and eternal consequences. And because we're believers, we actually share the truth, even though people don't want to hear it. Even though people get angry, and they do, and write letters to editors, and, and all about the bigots that, that are pastoring these churches and all. But it's because we care for the human soul and believe that eternity is at stake that we tell the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul said, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so we have a heart for people. We tell them the truth. They may not like it, but 
that's what our responsibility is, and we need to understand that. So Jesus isn't saying that you should just, just remain silent and let evil continue. He isn't saying remain silent while sin is celebrated in a society. What he is saying is do not seek personal vengeance when we are personally wronged. Now, when he is saying this, he gives us four illustrations. Notice he begins by saying, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If he slaps you on your right cheek, then turn the other. Now, I heard somebody say, I only have two. If you hit me a third time, you're, you're dead. <laughs> but what is the point that he's making here? Well, a slap to the face of a Jewish man was one of the highest insults that he would endure. It was an insult to what you call, he would call his personal digni dignity. So what is Jesus speaking about here? He's saying, what do you do when somebody insults you? Well, his answer is, do not seek to retaliate. Why? Because in your not seeking to retaliate, you're revealing a gentle and humble spirit. And if I want to have an example of somebody who did not seek to retaliate, all I need to do is look at my master, Jesus Christ. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, speaking of Messiah, wrote, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And that was something Jesus endured when you look in the Gospels. And it says in Matthew 26, 67, and 68, they spit on his face, they buffeted him, others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ who struck you. And so we use Jesus as our example, and so he says to us that we're not to have a spirit of retaliation. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Remember Jesus' prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Humble yourself. Trust God to protect your personal dignity. Is that easy? No. No, I'm not going to stand up here telling you that it is, because it's not. When somebody insults you, when somebody mocks you, when somebody says all manner of evil against you falsely, that can be, that can, that's tough. That can, that can be difficult. It can be very hard, because people have a tendency of believing the evil. They want to. There's, a, there's a something inside of us that, that responds to those kinds of things. And, and naturally, we're going to want to respond immediately. So how do you respond, Jesus is teaching us? You respond by not retaliating. Now, what, when he says, if, if, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let them have your cloak also. When he speaks of a tunic, that was like an undergarment. It was like a T-shirt. The cloak is your outer garment. It could be used as a blanket. So Jesus here is saying, secondly, um, how do you deal with somebody who has a legitimate claim against you? During his day, a, a person very often only had one coat or perhaps two tunics. Those were their personal garments. But if they went to court and the court made a decision against them, uh, if they had no money, they may take their garments. So what is Jesus saying by using that illustration? Be willing to offer more than required and resist the temptation to be bitter over it. A third, in verse 41, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Well, during Jesus' day, Roman law gave a soldier the right to force a civilian to carry a burden for a Roman mile. What is Jesus saying? Go the extra mile and do it with humility. In doing so, you'll be a good witness of the things of the kingdom of God. And then he says, lend to those who ask. I saw you grab your wallet just now. Lend to those who ask. By implication, lend to those who have a genuine need of help. Be generous and be quick to respond to real needs. In Proverbs 19, 17, we read, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Now, he's not commanding you, and he's not commanding me to be a soft touch. He's not. We are stewards. We should be responsible when we help other people. And, and I am 
wanting to be generous and wise at the same time. So I, I don't give to somebody who doesn't have a real obvious need. I'll give you an example, and I began this when I was in the service. I had someone approach me saying, can you lend me some money so I can buy cigarettes? And I said, no. If they said, hey, can you give me some money so I can buy something to drink, you know, a beer, I'd say, no. I'm not going to support your habit. And I remember telling one of my friends, I said, listen, if you're hungry, I'd buy you a sandwich, but you're wanting me to buy you cigarettes, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to support your habits. I'm not going to do that. And so I'm not a soft touch. A lot of times people think that churches have been established so that people who, who have need, any need, just show up and it's kind of like a, a place that we just, just throw things out. And, and that's not what the Lord is teaching here. There needs to be a discernment in that. And if I see a real and a legitimate need and I have the ability within my, my own personal means to help them, then I have an obligation before the Lord to be generous. Of course I do. But that doesn't mean that I should just give because somebody says, I want that. I mean, I can still remember when my kids were small. One in particular uh, had said to me, Daddy, I want this. And, and, uh, and I said, oh, really? Yeah, I want you to buy me this. And I know you have the money for it. I remember them saying that. I know you have the money for it. And, 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 and I said, well, just because I might have the money for it doesn't mean that I'm going to take it out of my wallet and buy this for you. I mean, just because your mother does that to me doesn't mean you can. <laughs> just because somebody says you have it and I want it doesn't mean that I give to you. But if there's a real need there, of course. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Generosity responds to genuine needs. And we give when there's a genuine need. And God does bless. So the spirit that Jesus is speaking about in this passage is really the spirit of peace. These things that he's speaking about reveal gentleness and humility. It reveals a heart that desires the best for other people. He's speaking about a way of life, a way of life that's not possible without the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. He's speaking about a way of life that requires the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to live. You see, it's the Spirit that moved Abraham to give his nephew Lot the best land, or that allowed Joseph to forgive his brothers who had sold him into slavery. It is the Spirit that led Stephen to pray for those who killed him, and it is the Spirit that moves us to do good to those who might not care for us. It is all the work of the Holy Spirit. The law when they tried to live according to its dictates, did not speak of the motives of the heart. But Jesus Christ is revealing the motives of the heart when he speaks concerning these things. What he's called us to do is to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh and not to retaliate simply because somebody has wounded us. He's speaking about the spirit of peace.